Transformative Principle, Episode 58, with Bill Daggett. I was fortunate enough to attend a conference in Nashville, Tennessee, called the Principals Academy, put on by the International Center for Leadership and Education, and it was amazing. Thankfully, I was able to sit down with a couple people from that and do some interviews, so this interview and the next one, and possibly a couple more after that, will... Um, be focusing on what I learned at this conference. So pretty inspiring, pretty motivating, and it was a great opportunity. Um, also, I am starting this thing called, let me start over with that. One of the things that I learned is that collaboration between people is incredibly important. I mean, we've known that for years, right? So one of the things that is helping us do that now more is technology and there's this new service called slack which i created a slack team for those of you who listen to the podcast and i invited those who are at the conference to join it as well um, if you go to transformative.slack.com put in your email address and you can join the team and we can share resources um, strategies that we're doing different things to help us out it's a pretty cool system and all the tweets that were sent as part of this conference are all archived in there and every time somebody tweets with the hashtag leader ed which was the hashtag for this conference it'll be ar archived in there as well so if you'd like to join that go to transformative.slack.com and you can sign up and be a part of it thanks so much Today we are fortunate to have Bill Daggett, the founder of the International Center for Leadership in Education. I'm a chairman and founder of the International Center for Leadership in Education. And can you tell me a little bit more about that organization? Uh, the International Center for Leadership and Education actually began as an organization 24 years ago. Um, 24 years ago, um, I was a senior official in the New York State Education Department and heading up a lot of the school reform initiatives for the state after a national report called The Nation at Risk. And uh, because New York was a large state, was kind of the epicenter at that time of school reform in the country. And given the fact I was heading up the school reform initiative, I had an awful lot of national and international exposure. And I was beginning to speak more and more. And I concluded to the surprise of an awful lot of people that I thought I could have a better, better impact on improving the education of children by leaving the state agency. And it shocked everybody because they said, why would he leave that position at his age? But I left to start the International Center. And if you think back to 1983, the nation at risk, it was all about international competition, i.e. the name International Center for Leadership and Education. And so what was happening is I was using my contacts in places like Japan and Germany and around the globe because there was a perception that those nations were dramatically outperforming our schools. And so I spent time in those nations. I understood what they tried to do. And I brought some of their best practices back to America. But what I soon learned uh, was that they were outperforming us in some ways, but they were dramatically worse than us in others. And probably the most telling way they were dramatically worse is they were not educating all kids. Uh, I'm a parent of five children. Uh, I have a daughter who is severely disabled. And I have a son that uh, was uh, in a terrible accident when he was 11 and was in a coma for nine months. Uh, lost functions of speech and hearing and a lot of taxia, couldn't write. Um, and then I have a daughter who's gifted and talented, one's a pretty good student, one that's kind of an okay student, plus the two disabled. And what I soon realized was that there was no nation in the world 
that we do for my family, what public education in America is doing for my family. And so I began to take on in the national media and other places saying, look, our schools are better than we think. And it began to gain traction. And so an interesting thing happened within a couple years into our, in a, the little company I created. Other nations began to see that too. And so we started, I started doing a lot of work in other nations. I spoke in 29 nations uh, in a two-year period of time. And it was about the strength of public education in America. But the international travel is tough. <laughs> and finally, I, I pulled the company back to focusing on America and what I thought was best for America. And uh, we have just continued to grow through the years. Uh, if you take our uh, total staff between the International Center, we have a not-for-profit arm called Successful Practices Network. We got about 70 full-time staff, uh, over 200 full uh, consultants who are uh, highly, highly successful in K-12 education themselves. You just witnessed uh, one of them, Sue Sack, Sackowitz. I have 200 Sue Sackowitzes. And you give us, and so what's now happened through the years is people say, we have a problem. My staff carefully interviews people. What's your problem? What are you trying to do? Why do you want to do that? And then what we simply, I, we play traffic cop. We try to find the best examples of a school that has done what somebody feels they want to do, and we mentor them. We, we create this mentor relationship, which is our consultants working with them. And uh, we ha hold an annual conference. We get anywhere from five to 8,000 people at our model schools conference. We'll be the last week in June in Atlanta this year. Um, and we showcase the best schools and the best practices. That's what we do as an organization. That sounds pretty awesome. How do schools get in contact with you? Um, yeah, what, what happens is I do an awful lot of speaking. I, I do about uh, 125, 130 speeches a year. I'm keynote in AASA, which is the National Su Superintendents Association. I'm keynote in the National School Boards Convention this year. I do a lot of state-wide uh, conventions. Uh, I've served as advisor to the National Governance Association, to the Council of Chief State School Officers. And so what happens is a lot of school superintendents and principals know who I am, and it's been all word of mouth. And so they, they either email her or call our office. Somebody on my staff says, well, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's simply how we grew the, grew the business, and we still do. People come to us, and we, we attempt to help them. So today you gave the keynote for the Conference Principals Academy that I'm attending right now. And I want to ask you some questions about what you talked about there. Can you talk to me about teaming and why that is so important for schools to do? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, initially, what we did in public education in America, and the world did it, it wasn't unique to America, is we thought about what do kids need to know? And we gather all that knowledge and we put it into disciplines. And so we have a math, and especially at the middle school and high school level, there's a math teacher, there's a science teacher, there's a social studies teacher, there's a language arts teacher, there's a career and tech ed teacher, there's art music, there's phys ed. And through the years, those disciplines took on a life of them, their own, and they became almost silos in a school. And we regulated and certified and tenured the teachers around them, began to test around the individual disciplines and make them highly qualified, no less. Yeah, make them highly qualified, exactly. And w we had organized the schools for the ease of teaching. Our company through the years created a byline. It, it says rigor relevance, and then the word all in caps, students. And as we began to work with the nation's most rapidly improving schools, what we began to recognize is they had organized their curriculum differently. What we began to recognize is that schools are really well organized for the top one-third of the kids academically. But for the rest of the kids, not necessarily so. And number two, that 
the kids who are obedient do well in school. But for that remaining two-thirds, you've got to motivate them. And relevance makes that possible. So we created this term, rigor, relevance, all students. The second you do that and you really begin to think about relevance, what we begin to uncover, and, and if you look at people like John Hattie, the research validates, is you can't get the relevance one discipline at a time. The real world doesn't function in disciplines, only schools. You want to motivate kids? You better make it relevant to them and relevant in a real world term. And as soon as you do that, you see that we have an incredible organizational problem. But we're so deep into it. <laughs> because if you think about educators, most educators liked school when they were kids. So they went to college to major in school. They even took elective courses in school so that when they graduated from college, they could return to K-12 education to do to others what had been done to them. And then everybody they work with thinks the same way. So it, it's almost like incestuous. What we began to see is you got to break that. And you break that by creating interdisciplinary approaches. But again, I go back, you got a third of the staff that say, yeah, let me try. Third say, uh, not me, I don't think, at least not right now. Another third say, over my dead body. If you try to integrate all those teachers, they're going to chew you alive. And so what we recommend is top, start with the top one third. Ideal world, have interdisciplinary departments multiple disciplines, have a math, science, social study, language, arts, art, music, CTE teacher, give them the same group of kids all day long and give the teachers a common planning period. But I don't think you can stop, start there in most schools. I think where you got to start is you got to find two teachers from two dis disciplines who might actually like each other. <laughs> it might be willing to work together. It might be a science teacher and a math teacher. It might be an English teacher and a social studies teacher. It might be a language arts teacher and a music teacher. Find people who are willing to work together. As administrators, build your uh, uh, school master schedule around them so you got them next to each other and put the same kids in their classes. And that's how you create that interdisciplinary approach. First year, a few teachers working together. Second year, maybe you can get three teachers to work together. It's about three to five years. And then what you've got are the whole team together in an interdisciplinary approach. So what would be your advice to a school like mine who already has common planning periods for a content area, but not interdisciplinary? Um, all of our science teachers have science prep at the same time. What would be your advice there? Um, uh, take some teachers who want to work together and give them the common planning period. I, I'm going to be honest. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to teachers in the same content area of having a common planning period. But they're really the group that needs at least. They all know their discipline. <laughs> what we don't know are each other's disciplines. Where we need the common planning period is between disciplines. But start with those who will be willing to try. <laughs> Don't force those that don't want to, because as a principal, you'll get an internecine warfare. And there's so, only so many ba battles. Susak Witt said it in this last session. There's only so many battles you can fight. you got to pick the battles where you can have the greatest impact. So in your opinion, it's okay to do things just with parts of the school rather than getting the whole entire school on board with the one thing. Yeah, I, I don't only think it's okay to do things with parts of the school. I think you have no choice initially. Uh, I'm the most impatient person in the world and I used to say, no, 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 just have everybody, you know, have everybody in interdisciplinary departments and, but you know what, Th that's too revolutionary and revolutionists get killed. Right. You got to make it evolutionary or you're not going to be successful, that's my advice. Let's talk about the teachers that you were talking about where you break them into thirds. The, you said don't fight with the lower third. What do you mean by that? I believe you can break the teachers into thirds. Uh, by the way, it's not unique to teachers. It's every profession. Uh, 
it's basically uh, humanity. There's a third of our staff that every time somebody like me shows up and they talk about change, they get excited, they love it, they're all excited. I call them the lunatic fringe because they're excited about everything. And then you got another third that usually are not really negative, but more likely cautious. Saying, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I get, I, we haven't done it that way before. Can you show me the hard data? Will it be on the test? Who's going to train us? Where would I get the technology? They're not negative. Sometimes I say they're almost realist. But forgive me, in most schools, we then have another third that basically say over my dead body, will you mess up my 1995 lesson plan? And, uh, and I've got it laminated. I'm not changing it. <laughs> my advice is because there are so many urgent and important things that school administrators have to deal with. You got to pick your battles. I wouldn't pick the battle with the bottom third. I'd leave them alone for a while. I would spend my limited time and resources with the top third who will figure it out if you, the administrator, helps run interference for them and are supportive of them. And if that when that top third make it work, that's what we just saw in Brockton. I mean, the one part that Sue didn't say is uh, myself, my organization, worked with her for seven years to get that district to where it is. But it's an unbelievable school now. It went from one of the lowest performing schools in the country to one of the highest performing with the same student population and same staff. Uh, you you got to do it slow and gradual. Get the top third. Have them work. Middle third will begin to watch. And it's not, you know, it's not always a third. Sometimes it's 25% in the top, 25% in the middle, and 50% on the bottom. Sometimes it's 10% on the top. You know, 10% in the middle and 80% on the bottom. But go with those where you think you can have the greatest success is my advice. If I were sitting in your schools, uh, in Alaska, what I would do is I would take that top third, top 10%, whatever it is, I would bring them to Atlanta this summer to the Model Schools Conference where for four days they will be emerged, emerged in not just Brockton and Susakowitz, but 40 schools like that. And they will talk teacher to teacher, principal to principal. That group will go back convinced they can walk on water. <laughs> and they will have created networks with all the other participants. And, and especially in places like Alaska, they need that. They need that ongoing network of people beyond their own building. I, I would send them land and let them see it. They'll come back charged up like nothing you've ever seen before. You said run interference for that top third. What does that mean? Um, <clears throat> uh, lots of times we think we can't do things because uh, there's a state regulation or a federal regulation or a local contract issue. Nine times out of ten, there's a way around most of those. There are variances you can get. Use your limited resources. Use your professional development dollars differently. I just gave you an example. Rather than spending all your money and all the staff in professional development, think about how much that costs you. Why don't you use a limited money on the top 10 or 20 percent of your staff. Do you know how much professional development you could give that top 10 or 20 percent? Could, you could have real impact. That's running interference. Um, may, uh, sometimes parents and kids are going to get excited. You need to sit with the parents and kids and say, wait, let's talk this through. Because most people, you know, think school is supposed to be what it was in the 90s, you know? And, and sometimes people have like an imagined perfection. They think schools were always good and everybody's always had high standards. That was never the case. We just imagine it that way. So it's all those kind of things of running interference. You said rigor, relevance, all students. How do we reconcile that where we, if we're just working on a few teachers, we're not going to reach all of our students? How do we reconcile that? You, you, uh, it, takes, it takes years to get to all students. That's the unfortunate part. However... Uh, I also didn't talk about the parents yet. I will tomorrow. Uh, Sue will too. 
because what you need to do is get parent advocates okay get some parent advocates and and how you get them S some of that top one third that in effect save a kid when I say save a kid you know it's suddenly a kid who was doing bad in school gets excited about school and their parents are excited you the and this is part of running the interference you need to go talk to that parent and say boy this teacher's doing a great job you know what I do if I were a principal I encourage that person if there is an opening on the board to run for the school board <laughs> you and, and, and we've done this in Brockton I mean slowly gradually and that's why it takes more than a year you you get a core group of people in your community some parents some business leaders some parent uh, uh, some of the staff and over a period of time it grows public education been around for a long time you don't change it overnight that's true you want to I want to me too but I caution you for a second time revolutionists get killed <laughs> okay talk about how schools are data rich and analysis poor and how we can change that in our schools. Yeah. Um, we have all kinds of reports required by the state and the feds. And it, a lot of it, you know, you got attendance issues, you got fiscal issues, you got test scores. But I shared today, and I will share deeper tomorrow and even deeper on Sunday, is I say measure what matters. I want to suggest to you measuring these things around what I call academic tenacity. Uh, are the kids, do the fi kids feel that school is relevant? Do they feel that it's engaging? Do they feel that uh, respected and, and have strong relationships with teachers and peers? Do they feel like they're not bullied? Well, what we suggest is, is we call them the we surveys which I'll describe at this conference later on. We got a bank of 100 questions we've been using, uh, 540,000 kids. And we asked the kids just to give us their opinions. But then we asked the teachers their opinions on the same questions. And what we see is dramatic differences between what a teacher feels and what the, and the kids feel. What we say is take, use that data not in a punitive way, not part of the teacher evaluation. In fact, I often say, let teachers be the only pe people who see the results for their own class. Okay? But when the kids say, what you're teaching is irre irrelevant, but the teacher had answered, no, what I teach is very relevant, then you can have that discussion. That's the type of data that begins to turn schools around. Okay? Again, key to success in school is student engagement. <laughs> Primarily, and that's academic tenacity. Secondary, parent engagement. I think these WE surveys are an incredible way for everybody to just say time out. Say, and yet I don't want them on a report card. I don't want them on the evaluation of the teacher. I don't want it on the evaluation of the school. I want to as a time out. How are we doing? Let's just talk about it. So that's my data rich. Uh, but analysis poor, we don't have good data on what I think are the most important things that turn schools around, which is academic tenacity and parent and community engagement. So we have what's called a school climate and connected as survey, which is probably exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's the same type of thing. And those are the things I think that are really powerful and important. And but. And we got to know how to use them in a non-threatening, informative way for the adults. With those surveys, how often would you how often would you suggest that we use those surveys? Twice a year. Twice a year. Yeah, I would do them mid fall and late spring. Mid fall, so you're far enough into the school year, so the kids have some opinions of what's going on. Okay, and and uh, that's almost like the pre uh, pre test, if you will, and then late spring to see how it really worked. Uh, we, we really encourage twice a year, and, and they take about fifteen twenty minutes. I, I don't think you need to spend more time than that, but boy, they are informative. Uh, by the way, we just passed a lady in the hall walking here, and she told me she was from Mississippi. I can't. I don't remember the lady. Okay. But she said we turned her school around. As I think about it, they had done the WE surveys. And that's one of the things that really turned that school around. They said, whoa, we're, 
the kids see this totally differently than we do. And then we sent one of our staff and said, well, let's sit down with the staff and let's have a, a real discussion about that. And how do you turn that around? And she just said, turned it from a D school to a B school in her state. She was talking about her school's grade, not how students feel. Mm -hmm. That Their actual student performance right. determines their school grade. Yep. Why does how they feel matter so much to their student achievement? If the kids feel curriculum is relevant. If they feel they're doing this, not simply because an adult said, I've got to do this. The kids feel, this is, I need to do this to have a better quality of life. And I, my light and lo, uh, lot in life is going to be better because of this. And therefore, I really want to learn this. They're going to do better in school. The second they do better in school, your school grade as a school goes up because their test results improve. I laid out this morning four areas. Content methodology, academic tenacity, parent community. Most of us are so hung up on the content, meaning the state tests, the teacher evaluation around some of that, that we can't get to the next three items. High performing schools don't begin with content. They begin with getting the kid engaged, having the kid feel rel that their curriculum is relevant and wanting to do well test performance will go through the ceiling but you don't do that by having a one one hour workshop somewhere it's creating a culture and so the statement I made this morning I will make repeatedly throughout this conference culture trumps strategy and uh, my entire presentation tomorrow morning is how do you create the culture if somebody wants more in information about what you're doing how would somebody contact you uh, uh, if they uh, just go to our website uh, leadered.com uh, they would get it uh, and uh, our phone number is there our email is there and uh, our case studies of all these schools like Brockton are all there so leadered.com or if they google the International Center for Leadership and Education they get all kinds of stuff on us Thank you for listening to Transformative Principle today. If you wouldn't mind, please leave a review in iTunes or Stitcher Radio, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. And if you'd like to join the community, please go to transformative.slack.com and sign up to be part of the Transformative team. You can get great resources, additional help, and talk to some other amazing principles. Transformative.slack.com.